Hi, everybody. My name is Adam Pick, and I'd like to welcome you to the webinar titled, What Should You Know About Heart Valves and Atrial Fibrillation? If I have yet to meet you, I'm a former patient, and I'm also the founder of heartvalvesurgery.com. Our mission is to educate and empower patients with heart valve disease. This webinar, which has had over 390 registrations from patients in countries all over the world, is designed to support that mission. During the webinar, all participants will be in what we call listen-only mode. That being said, you may submit questions during the webinar. Simply post your questions in the control panel on your screen. We will do our best to address those questions during the Q&A section of the webinar. Lastly, at the end of the webinar, we're going to ask you to take a very quick five-question survey about this event. Now, I am thrilled to introduce the featured speakers for this session. Dr. Patrick McCarthy is the Executive Director of the Bloom Cardiovascular Institute and the Chief of Cardiac Surgery at Northwestern Medicine in Chicago. Dr. McCarthy has achieved a national and international recognition in the fields of complex adult cardiac surgery, including valve repair and valve replacement and atrial fibrillation. He has performed amazingly over 10,000 heart operations during his career, and of those, more than 4,000 involved valve therapy. Dr. James Thomas is a world-renowned cardiologist and the director of the Center for Heart Valve Disease at Northwestern. Dr. Thomas has more than 500 peer-reviewed publications and is past president of the American Society of Echocardiography. Also joining us today is Jane Cruse, who many of you know as Northwestern's Valve and AFib Clinic Coordinator. Jane will be helping us out during the Q&A section of the webinar. I could go on and on and on about the careers of Dr. McCarthy, Dr. Thomas, Jane, and their achievements in cardiac care. Instead, I will simply tell you that this team is celebrated by our community and for good reason. Since launching this website in 2006, Northwestern has successfully treated many, many, many patients from this website, including Robert Winner, Sarah Bloomfield, Ron Rovin, Gene Cook, Sharon Knickerbocker, Lisa Woods, Mark Croto, John DeFazio, Carol Rice, Charlotte Hartzell, and Debbie Cross. Personally, I am humbled that Dr. McCarthy, Dr. Thomas, and Jane are taking time away from their very busy practices at Northwestern to share their experiences and clinical research during this educational webinar. So to start, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Patrick McCarthy. Dr. McCarthy? Thanks, Adam. And once again, thank you for all that you do for the patients. I know that it is uh, really important for them to have this amount of education. And frankly, uh, 10 years ago, before you were there, I think we had to answer at least twice as many questions, but now you have informed everybody and brought them all up to speed, and so that really helps a lot. Um, so I'm joined with Jim Thomas, my old friend and colleague from the Cleveland Clinic days, uh, where I was for 14 years, and Jim and I have known each other for decades now, and so we're really thrilled to have him here at Northwestern with us, and also wanted Jane here, because Jane uh, really runs the preoperative evaluation for patients, but then also the post-operative monitoring, which is so important for patients with atrial fibrillation, because unlike a valve repair where you just fix it and then the valve is going to stay the same, atrial fib needs a little managing the first few months, and so we'll get on with that. So um, if I could have the next slide, Adam, and Adam, let me know if you can hear me very well. Uh, you just chime in there. So. Um, I thought that what we would do is just start with uh, a little brief synopsis of a patient just to make this sort of grounded so that people can relate to it. And so I chose one of the community members who I won't name, uh, but it's up to her if she would want to. Uh, it's a 53-year-old woman uh, who had mitral regurgitation who'd had it for decades since she was in her 20s, and it had become symptomatic sometime in the late 2000s. Um, and also her tricuspid annulus had become dilated. She had a patent frame in ovale. Uh, many of you may have heard of that. It's present in about 20% of patients. It's a small opening uh, between the two atria. And then she, eventually she developed atrial fibrillation and went to the ER and cardioverted. 
So it was a bit of a circuitous course, but eventually she ended up here at Northwestern and just over a year ago, she had a mitral valve repair, a tricuspid valve repair. We did a maze procedure for the atrial fib, and then we closed her left atrial appendage and that hole in her heart. A year later, she's doing very well. And so, you know, we just thought that that would be a good example of a patient with multiple valves involved and also atrial fibrillation because that's the kind of patient that we see quite a bit. So. With that patient to start us off, I'm going to turn this over now to Dr. Thomas, who's going to talk to us about uh, the heart and the valves. And uh, if we could have the next slide, uh, he'll get us launched on that. Thanks a lot, Pat. And uh, thanks, Adam, for giving us this opportunity to address your community. It's really a valuable service that you do, and uh, we welcome the opportunity. Now, uh, what I'm going to be talking about uh, in the next few minutes is probably uh, pretty basic for a lot of the folks on this site here, but uh, just to bring everyone up to speed, uh, let's consider where are the heart valves, and if you'd go on to the next, uh, uh, next slide there. Uh, the heart basically has four valves, and their function is to allow blood to go forward without obstruction through the heart and to keep it from leaking backwards. Next slide. Now the main pumping chambers are the right and left ventricle. The right ventricle pumps blood through the lungs. The left ventricle pumps blood through the rest of the body. And you can see there, uh, they're obviously turned around here because it's as if you're looking at the heart uh, straight on there. And these are where we get into the valves. Next slide, please. And here you can see the uh, the probably the three most commonly diseased valves. You see the aortic valve, the mitral valve, and the tricuspid valve. Um, and if we uh, go on, we can talk about those. Next slide. Now, first of all, we have to understand what a remarkable thing it is that the valves do. In an average year, the heart valves open and close over 40 million times. Next slide. And this means that by age 65, your heart valves have opened and closed over 2.6 billion times. And in a, a person who has a good long lifetime, uh, you may get up to 4 billion different uh, openings and closings of all four of your heart valves. So pretty remarkable that for the most part, they work for all of us to the, to the very end. Next slide. Now there is a huge burden of valvular heart disease among those valves that don't function so well with all those openings and closings. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with bicuspid aortic valves where the aortic valve has only two leaps instead of three. There are over three million Americans with bicuspid aortic valves and it's the most common congenital abnormality. Now considering all forms of aortic stenosis, after age 75, moderate or severe aortic stenosis is uh, detected in 2.8% of the population and uh, moderate or severe regurgitation in about 2% of the population. Considering mitral regurgitation, there are about 5 million Americans with moderate or severe mitral regurgitation, uh, ultimately a 10% risk of this in patients over 75 years of age. And now casting our view more uh, worldwide, there are at least 20 million patients around the world with significant rheumatic valve disease, and this is a huge burden uh, for the developing world. Next slide. Let's consider first aortic stenosis, which is uh, probably uh, the most common lesion uh, that we have to face here. And this uh, is a situation where the aortic valve, which remember is the valve that allows the blood to pass out into the aorta and the rest of the body and prevents it from leaking backwards into the left ventricle, it develops an obstruction that, that makes it harder to pump the blood out into the body. Next slide. Aortic regurgitation, as you see here, 
allows blood to leak back into the ventricle. Next slide. If we think about how this impacts the heart for aortic stenosis, uh, this will lead to higher pressures in the left ventricle as it has to push harder to open that valve. It will lead to an abnormal thickening of the left ventricular wall because the heart is basically doing extra work on every heartbeat. Uh, ultimately, this can lead to weakening of the uh, left ventricular muscle leading to symptoms of heart failure. And, and these symptoms can include shortness of breath, chest pressure, lightheadedness, and even passing out. Aortic regurgitation has its main consequence, enlargement of the left ventricle, as all of that extra blood sloshes back into the left ventricle. This causes the heart to dilate and the walls to thin, and it can lead to weakening of the left ventricular muscle, also resulting in heart failure and symptoms of shortness of breath uh, and or chest pressure. Now we speak about these two lesions separately, but you have to understand that very commonly they occur together. And you have situations where aortic regurgitation may make the, uh, the uh, hemodynamic effects of aortic stenosis worse and vice versa. They are often compounding lesions. Next slide. Consider next mitral regurgitation, which leads to leakage from the left ventricle into the left atrium. Now this can be caused either by diseases of the mitral valve itself, like mitral valve prolapse or flail or an infection uh, or rheumatic heart disease, or it can be caused by situations where the left ventricle is distorted, perhaps from a, from a heart attack or some other disease of the heart muscle that stretches out the, uh, the mitral valve and causes it to leak, even though its actual structure is pretty normal. Next slide. With that leakage, you get enlargement of the left atrium as well as the left ventricle and increased pressure in the lungs. Next slide. The consequences of this are a weakening of the left ventricular muscle uh, in uh, ultimately causing heart failure, elevation of the blood pressure in the lungs, which leads to pulmonary hypertension. It can lead to uh, right heart failure and tricuspid valve regurgitation. And finally, it can lead to atrial fibrillation and the risk of strokes from blood clots in the left atrium. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Thomas, it's Adam, and I've got a real quick question for you, and I, I, I know it's a question sure. I have, and I imagine some of the folks on the call have, is when we hear that there's leaking of blood backwards across the valve, um, is it possible for you to quantify the amount of leakage that occurs for a patient with, let's say, severe regurgitation? Is it um, half of a pump? Is it a quarter of a pump? Can you, can you share about what that means for, in terms of the quantity of, of backflow? Yes, absolutely. No, we do this uh, routinely every day in the echocardiography laboratory and in the uh, uh, magnetic resonance imaging suite. And um, we can do this in a semi-quantitative way just by looking at, uh, at the appearance on the echocardiogram. But more and more, we're trying to really quantify it down to the milliliter. And we, uh, we say that uh, uh, patients who have mild regurgitation may only be leaking 10 or 15 milliliters. That's about a uh, tablespoon. Um, and uh, patients with moderate regurgitation are leaking about an ounce of blood with each pumping cycle, and patients who have severe regurgitation are leaking about two ounces or a quarter cup uh, per pumping cycle there. And uh, these are measurements that guide uh, our indications for when patients may need surgery. Wow, that's, that's much more than I expected. Thank you so much. All right, and you can see here the subject of uh, second topic of our uh, discussion today is the intersection of atrial fibrillation and valvular heart disease and all the problems that can uh, come from atrial fibrillation.
Uh, next slide. First of all, let's say, what is atrial fibrillation? It's something that is very common, uh, but uh, it's still a little bit mysterious. And you can see on the left side of the uh, slide here, um, the normal passage of electricity through the heart. The, the uh, um, impulse is initiated in uh, the right atrium there and then passes into the left atrium and down into the ventricle. So there's a very steady, regular pumping that occurs in both chambers uh, and promotes maximal efficiency of the heart. In contrast, look on the right and you can see that there are all these little rotors of of electricity going around in the left atrium that really leads to a chaotic rhythm uh, with very little mechanical contraction at all. And when that passes into the ventricle, it can go very rapidly. So the, the uh, ventricle may have heart rates as high as 180 or 200 beats per minute, uh, and that leads to very inefficient uh, contraction of the heart. Next slide. Now, who gets atrial fibrillation? In most cases, atrial fibrillation is associated with some underlying heart disease, coronary artery disease, hypertension, congestive heart failure, pulmonary embolus, uh, emphysema or other lung disease, hyperthyroidism. Uh, you can see it following any, uh, any cardiac surgery, patients who drink excessive alcohol, or just uh, the the ravages of uh, getting older. And, uh, but one of the most common causes of atrial fibrillation is valvular heart disease, as we're discussing today. And we also have to recognize that there are a certain number of patients who develop what we call lone atrial fibrillation. They have no particularly obvious risk factor. They may have some, some genetic predisposition to it, uh, but they just develop it on its own. Next slide. The prevalence of, aortic, uh, uh, of uh, atrial fibrillation is increasing, and you can see uh, on this graph here, plotting out over the next 35 years that by 2050, we estimate there will be almost 16 million patients in the United States with atrial fibrillation. You can see that even now, uh, there's uh, somewhere between 7 and 8 million patients with atrial fibrillation, a very common uh, uh, disease in the American people. Next slide. If we just look at the lifetime risk for developing atrial fibrillation, you can see that among 40-year-old uh, men, they have about a 26% risk of developing AF, and women, it's about a 23% risk. Uh, now, you may consider that it's sort of paradoxical that it looks like the risk goes down with age. Well, it's just that you're selecting out the ones who don't develop atrial fibrillation. So if you've made it to 80 and haven't had atrial fibrillation before then, you only have about a 23% risk of having it after that because you've, you've sort of passed 80 years of the test. Next slide. Now, electrophysiologists have divided uh, the types of atrial fibrillation into three basic uh, categories there. Uh, they can be paroxysmal, where you get a brief burst of atrial fibrillation, but it basically terminates itself and goes back into the regular rhythm. Um, it can be persistent, where it's not self-terminating, but it can be uh, turned back to the regular rhythm with either uh, medicines or a, uh, an electrical shock. And then permanent atrial fibrillation are the ones that have been in atrial fibrillation without interruption for a long period of time. Next slide. There are a number of consequences of, of atrial fibrillation. First of all, the heart doesn't fill properly at the uh, irregular and uh, rapid heartbeats. So the patient may feel more tired, they may have less energy. Uh, the irregular heartbeat leads to symptoms of skipped beats and palpitations and fluttering. But really the biggest worry we have is the formation of blood clots in the uh, left and right atria as they fibrillate there. And these blood clots can propagate throughout the, uh, the body. Most worrisome is when they propagate to the brain and cause a stroke. 
but they can go anywhere in the body. And so once you are on, once you are in atrial fibrillation, most patients will need some form of blood thinner to uh, reduce the risk of clots forming. Next slide. And this just shows the percentage of strokes that are associated with atrial fibrillation. And you can see that as patients get older, a higher and higher percentage of them will have their strokes associated with atrial fibrillation there as, they, uh, uh, as there is more and more atrial fibrillation in these age groups. Next slide. And I'll close with this uh, showing uh, a, an image of an echocardiogram showing the clot or thrombus in the left atrial appendage. Echocardiography is the best way to identify blood clots in the heart. And when we see something like this, we know we have to do uh, anticoagulation, or if you have a handy surgeon around, he can address the problem directly. So I'll turn this back over to Dr. McCarthy, and uh, he'll discuss some of these surgical approaches to atrial fibrillation. Thanks, Jim. Adam, can you hear us okay? You sound great. Okay, great. Uh, well, anyone that's squeamish in the audience might want to close their eyes for just a minute. Uh, what I'm showing here is this is a picture of one of those blood clots that uh, I took on a video in the operating room. And I think what you can appreciate, this is a pretty big blood clot. It's almost the length of your little finger and it's about uh, half an inch wide. And uh, so we were operating in a patient to do the mitral valve and we found this. It points out that in atrial fib in particular, um, the strokes can be serious business because if that breaks off and it goes up to your brain, uh, the strokes in patients with atrial fib are the most fatal uh, that patients have or most likely to leave them with a significant disability so that they're paralyzed. So strokes from atrial fib in particular can be very dangerous. Can we move on to the next slide, Ben? <clears throat> so how do we treat it? Uh, so the first is we always look, is there some underlying problem that we can treat? Um, like, for instance, Dr. Thomas mentioned hyperthyroidism. If we find that, that's always great because we can get the thyroid under control and then frequently the atrial fib goes away. But of course, if you get older, we don't know how to treat that. We haven't come up with that treatment yet. The second thing that what we do is we control the heart rate. Uh, he mentioned that some patients have a really fast heartbeat instead of your normal heartbeat at 70, at maybe 120. So you go on some medications that slow it down to like 80. Third is that sometimes we use antiarrhythmic medications. Those are actually medicines that we use to try to get the heart rhythm to go back to normal. Um, it depends on the age of the patients. It depends on the symptoms of the patients. Um, but uh, in some patients, that may well be um, the right answer. And then there's what's called catheter ablation. If patients have no other major reasons to undergo surgery, the electrophysiologist, the heart rhythm specialist, can put a catheter up there and do an ablation, which means that they sort of ablate tissue by freezing it or burning it to get rid of the areas where the AFib begins. And then what we're going to talk about from now on is surgical ablation, which is frequently called the maze procedure. And at the time, we also close that left atrial appendage where I just saw the blood clot or sometimes actually excise that. We cut that off. Next slide. So I thought that I would show just a little bit about how do we do this. Um, it used to be 25 years ago when the operation was developed, we would actually do the ablation by taking a pickups and scissors and actually cutting the atrial tissue. If you cut it, that uh, the electrical wave front can't travel across the areas that have been cut. So that's an ablation in itself. But about 15 years ago, some new technology, this is showing a clamp, uh, was developed. And if this passes radio frequency energy from one side of the clamp to the other, and this is showing that we're clamping the pulmonary veins. Next slide. And that was a very common way that we treat it, is to do an ablation with radiofrequency ablation. Then eventually, by doing different applications of the clamp, you can recreate that maze procedure. The most important part of everything that we do is shown by the yellow and the purple lines. 
You see the four holes down though, down below at six o'clock. Those are the four pulmonary veins entering into the left atrium. Not in everyone, but in most patients, that's the source. That's where the atrial fib develops. And so what we want to do is separate that part out from the rest of the atria. And so the yellow and the purple lines are just showing that we would essentially create an island below where those pulmonary veins are. But after the ablation, any aberrant electrical impulses can't travel across that maze of pathways uh, to the uh, rest of the heart. Next slide. There's another one. You might want to close your eyes if you get squeamish, but this is actually how we do it most commonly, which is by doing cryoablation, where we actually freeze the tissue to 150 degrees centigrade below zero for one to two minutes. And so the white there is a cryoprobe, uh, and that is actually frost that forms on it quickly and up at 12 o'clock is actually the mitral valve in this patient. Next slide. So what is the risk of doing this operation? Um, there isn't all that much to the, the risk of it. Adam, can you move this one up? Um, our national database from the Society of Thoracic Surgery uh, did a look back uh, from, uh, no, back up one, uh, did a look back from 2004 to 2006 and what they found is with the new technologies, all it does is it adds nine minutes to the time, the cross clamp time, which is when the heart is stopped, and nine minutes to the cardiopulmonary bypass time, which is the time on the heart-lung machine. So it's actually is pretty quick uh, to add this procedure. And considering the impact on the rest of the patient's life, we tend to do that. Next slide. Uh, Dr. McCarthy, if I could uh, just ask you a quick question. Sure. It, so it seems like there's no additive risk or significant additive risk here. Um, and so is it common for then for these con concomitant procedures to occur across all cardiac centers or are there some um, cardiac centers where things like the maze procedure are done at the same time as valvular procedures more regularly? Yeah, that's a good question and there's going to be a data slide coming up in a little bit, but um, across the country if you look at it during mitral surgery about 50% of the time when someone has a mitral surgery they may get an ablation, a maze type operation if they have atrial fib. It varies widely. There are some places that just don't do it. They're just not that familiar with it. They're not that comfortable with it. And then we're at about 95% of our patients. Uh, if they have atrial fib and we're there to do a mitral operation, we will do it. There's that 5% are just patients that have maybe had atrial fib for 30 years and we just know it's not going to work. Or it may be somebody that had an episode when they were 21 years old and maybe had a little bit of a long weekend and a little too much alcohol involved and that was 30 years ago and so it wasn't related to the valve disease but pretty much if we're there to do a mitral operation in particular and somebody has atrial fib we'll go ahead and we'll treat it. Next slide. Thank you. And this one I'm not going to spend much time this is just showing that in medicine there's always publications and there's studies and all and so uh, if you look at the far right where all those p-values, anything less than 0.05 means it's important. And if you look at NSR means sinus rhythm, meaning a regular rhythm, in 80% if it was treated on the top one and uh, on the left, if it wasn't treated, 26%. So basically all of these studies are showing that if somebody goes to surgery and they have atrial fib and you don't treat it, especially if it's been there for a year or two, um, they're unlikely to come out of it, like in the 20-30% range on average. But if you treat it, then it's going to be mostly in the 75-80% range. So we can treat this pretty well. Next slide. And the next slide, Adam, is going to speak to what you had asked about, which is how often do we actually treat this and how often does it occur? So this looked again at our database and what we found is that of patients going to mitral surgery, 27% of them had atrial fib before surgery. So it's very common in patients with, um, with heart valve disease. Uh, in patients with aortic valve disease, it's less common, but it's still about 5 to 7% of them have it. Um, ablation at this early phase was 28%, and it went to 40% across the U.S. It's up to about 50% now. Um, so it's picking up, but it still isn't all that, that common. Next slide. And then um, 
the important one that we found is that, okay, well, if I have it, patients are always asking, how successful is it? Like I can tell them the success rate for a mitral valve repair, maybe 98% or more, and, you know, tell them what the risks are. Atrial fib ablation is pretty good, um, but it's not quite as good. It's a far more complex problem. The mitral valve and aorta valve, those are just plumbing. This is the electricity now. And so this is, you saw all those different rotors, Dr. Thomas called it. This is a lot more complex to fix. And what we're making the point here is if they're paroxysmal, meaning that you have it one day and then you don't have it for a week and then you have it again, chances of success here at Northwestern were 85%. Contrast to the far right, the longstanding ones, patient may have had atrial fib continuously for five or 10 years then the chance for success was about 70% overall. So um, the chances of success drop if you've been in it for, and I see people in 20, 30 years of atrial fib. Next slide. Um, then they wanna know, well, how do we measure the success of it? And then this is a really dramatic example that Jane found and the little black lines on the left are indicating episodes of atrial fib as we're picked up on a pacemaker. And so the black line indicates that the patient was in atrial fib in a 24-hour day, and it might be that the patient was in for an hour or for 25 hours or 24 hours or something. And then at the red circle is when we did the ablation, we did the maze procedure. And then after that, there's no more atrial fib. And so you can see before the operation, a lot of atrial fib pretty much daily, varying from an hour to, you know, 24 hours, and then afterwards it's gone, it's ablated, and it stops. So monitoring is really important afterwards uh, because some people do have a recurrence, and if you have a recurrence, it doesn't mean it didn't work. It means that we need to work at it to try to get rid of it. Next slide. So with all of the data, and I'm skipping all the high-level cardiology and cardiac surgery that went into it, our societies got together to come up with what we call guidelines or recommendations. And so what we first published in 2007 was that it's advisable that all patients with documented AFib referred for other cardiac surgery, a mitral valve operation most commonly, but sometimes aortic or bypass, undergo a, a procedure, a maze type procedure at an experience center, unless it will add significant risk. And occasionally um, it is for uh, different reasons, it may add some risk to the patient, so we wouldn't do it. So, but most of the time we do it. So next slide, I think we just have one that is a conclusion before we go on to answer some questions. So um, AFib is very common in heart valve patients, especially mitral patients, where it's in our, it's probably our referral pattern, but 40% of the patients that I see before mitral surgery have atrial fib, and I think it's just their cardiologists refer them because they know that I'm going to treat it. The AFib may cause a lot of different symptoms, decreased heart function and stroke. Some people don't have symptoms. Some, they just go in to see their doctor and they get an EKG and they find out about it, but other people describe it as even, I've heard, like a percolator, a coffee percolator in your chest because it's pounding and it's irregular. A lot of young people, Adam, you may be too young to even know what a coffee percolator is, but uh, older people like me know. Um, I'm, not, I'm, not, most... I'm, not, I'm not that young. I'm not that. that right. uh, I remember my so nana's percolator quite like, well. All right. Yeah. Well, that's good. Your grandmother's. So um, most of the patients that go through surgery can have the AFib ablated while we're there, especially with mitral surgery. It adds about nine minutes. The risk is low. The effectiveness is high but especially if you follow up. And so if you do have atrial fib and you're going for surgery, it's something to ask your cardiologist and your surgeon about uh, if they're going to go ahead and treat that while they're in the neighborhood, as we say. So thanks, Adam. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Great, and uh, thank you, Dr. McCarthy, Dr. Thomas, for all your dedication to the space, and, and both on the valvular side and the AFib side. This has um, been very helpful for me to learn much more. And we are going to shift gears into the question and answer section. And what I encourage everybody to do is, if you have a question, go ahead and ask it uh, using the control panel in the upper right part of your screen. Um, we are going to start the Q&A with a question that came in from Patricia 
and she asks, I had a mitral valve replacement almost five years ago. Is there an age limit on valve replacement? I worry that the doctor will tell or refuse to operate on me when I need a replacement if I am too old. Does this ever happen? Well, I guess I would have to mention that Patricia, a patient that we met several years ago who needed her aorta valve replaced. She was very symptomatic, and she wanted to see her great-grandchild uh, born, which was due any day, and she was 101 years old. And so it was the very earliest days when we were replacing the valve without surgery, the transcatheter aorta valve replacement. So at 101, that certainly was sort of stretching the limit. I'd certainly replaced heart valves in patients in their 90s, but we replaced her heart valve with that transcatheter. The next day, she was sitting up in her chair. She put on her lipstick already when I saw her, and I'm happy to report she's now 106 years old. So um, no, we don't have any upper age limit. So patients go through this at a lot of different ages. Wow, that is a that is a great story. And we're now moving she's on. She's one in a million, though. Yeah. Now we're moving on to a question about uh, post-op AFib, which is something I hear about from patients um, frequently. And James says, I had an aortic valve replacement in November 2013 and went into AFib two days after the surgery. I had a successful electro electroconversion before being discharged from the hospital. I was prescribed metoprolol, Moltac, warfarin for my continuing AFib treatment. I've had no reoccurrence of AFib since discharge from the hospital. That's great. But he, James asked, what is the outlook for getting off of the medication? Well, um, when AFib occurs early after surgery in a patient that has never had it before, it's not that uncommon, and it can be you know, somewhere around 20 to 30 percent. And we think that it is related to inflammation around the heart because we were just in there, and there's this inflammatory response that can trigger atrial fib. And usually before patients go home, it's done, although they're on medication. Now, most commonly, the way we would treat it would be to stop those medications after about two months. And since they're now pretty far away from the inflammatory response early after surgery, for the majority of those patients, it won't recur. And so for most patients, the outlook for getting off the medications is very, very high. Now, in the situation for James, it's possible that the doctor has been doing some additional follow-up and found other episodes of atrial fibrillation or uh, found other reasons that he wanted him on uh, metoprolol in particular, which is common uh, beta blocker. But if it's as simple as just an atrial fib episode two days after surgery, um, typically, we stop the medications after about two months, and it's unusual that it would recur. Great. And here's a question about bicuspid aortic valves and blood pressure. And Joe asks, I have a bicuspid aortic valve which is not yet ready for surgery. Is low blood pressure a result of valve disease? And will both the systolic and diastolic number normalize after surgery? Well, thanks so much, Joe. Uh, it's an interesting question, and, and obviously I can't answer it definitively, not knowing a lot more about the case. But assuming that you have only mild to moderate stenosis or regurgitation, I wouldn't anticipate that that by itself would be having a lot of impact on your blood pressure. So it may be that your blood pressure is low for other reasons. Um, you certainly want to talk to your doctor about that. Uh, sometimes some of the medication that you may be on will be contributing to this, or some patients just happen to run a low blood pressure, and in general, that's a good thing. We like low blood pressure, uh, and uh, as long as it's not causing you to be lightheaded or pass out when you stand up, uh, that's not really a, a problem for worry there. Uh, if, in fact, you are more advanced in your disease and you have severe aortic stenosis, that uh, could possibly produce a low blood pressure there, and uh, assuming that the heart pumps more efficiently afterwards, the blood pressure might come up. Uh, but uh, that, again, gets into the real details of exactly what's going on with your case uh, that we just can't predict uh, in a, a general forum like this. Great, and I encourage everybody to keep asking your questions. They're coming in left and right here. We're gonna move on to the next one. 
And this is about mechanical valves and INR. And Sarah asks for, for a patient 69 years old who has an artificial mechanical heart valve and pacemaker and on warfarin, what is the recommended INR range to be considered stable? Is it between two to three or 2.5 to 3.5? And maybe you can talk about what INR is as well. Okay, well, that's a great question. And yes, INR uh, stands for International Normalized Ratio, which is a fancy way of saying how thin is your blood. And basically, when you are when you're not taking any blood thinner at all, your INR should be around one. So these are all sort of um, you can kind of think that an INR of two is your blood is kind of twice as thin as it is uh, at rest. That's a, probably an oversimplification there. Uh, but obviously, the higher the uh, INR, the thinner your blood, and the less likely it is form a clot, but also the more likely you are to have bleeding complications. So we, we don't want the, uh, the INR too low, or you may form a clot with your mechanical valve, or too high, because that increases the risk of bleeding. Now, the two ranges that you put here are the two most common ranges, and they, which one is recommended for the most part if you are young and healthy and have a mechanical valve, particularly in the aortic position, um, a, uh, a range of two to three is generally recommended. Now, for certain older types of, uh, of heart valves, particularly in the mitral position, or if you have some degree of left ventricular dysfunction, or especially if you have atrial fibrillation on top of your mechanical valve in the, in the mitral position, you would need the higher range, the 2.5 to 3.5. And then just recently, the FDA has approved um, uh, one of the mechanical heart valves in the aortic position, uh, the onyx valve, uh, to be uh, to have even um, INRs below two. So you need to discuss with your your surgeon and your cardiologist exactly what they recommend um, in your particular situation. You have to factor a lot of the different. Uh, patient-specific factors in there to say what the right uh, what the right value is, but there is at least one uh, mechanical heart valve that in very low-risk patients, you can go a bit under two in your uh, blood thinning. Great. Thanks, Dr. Thomas. And we're going to move on to a question that we have been heard, hearing more and more about with the innovation of TAVR. And Irene asks, does the TAVR procedure carry more risk than the conventional open chest surgical option? And she referenced one of the risks being stroke. Well, that's a terrific question. And, and I will say this is very much a moving target. And, um, you know, if we go back to the early days of TAVR, uh, just uh, so everyone knows, that's the transcutaneous aortic valve re replacement, a catheter uh, replacement of the aortic valve. It was really intended only for the very highest risk patients, patients who really were too sick to undergo surgery. And we showed that in those patients, um, they certainly did better than, than no intervention. Medical management is basically no management. So uh, it was safer than, than not doing uh, anything to them. Um, and then in the high risk patients, it compared favorably to the surgical risks. Now, there were certain risks that were slightly higher, um, at least early on, and, and one of those is stroke. And you can imagine when these valves are put in uh, that there can be some dislodgement of some of the, the calcium on the valve uh, that can lead to a stroke. And, the, and very early on, in the first few days, there was a somewhat higher risk of stroke uh, uh, than the surgical patients. But if you look out over a year, this difference uh, virtually uh, went away, and the, the, there was no real significant difference uh, over the long run there. As TAVR uh, procedures have gotten safer and, and, uh, and new devices have been developed, uh, these risks have gotten even lower and lower, and so now we're seeing uh, patients who are not at the very high risk, uh, but probably moving towards, uh, uh, in not too long, patients who are at more intermediate risk for surgery there. And uh, we just have to keep monitoring them very closely because we know in these patients, surgery is very safe. And we just have to make sure that uh, the TABR uh, is uh, maintaining that good safety profile uh, as we move to lower risk patients. 
Great, and we are having a quick follow-on question coming in from Maria D'Agostino uh, regarding TAVR, Dr. Thomas and Dr. McCarthy. She writes, I had an aortic tissue valve replaced in March, doing well. My doctor said it'll last 15 years, hopefully. But my question is, will or can the TAVR procedure be used when the time comes? For yeah, absolutely. Uh, she's, uh, she's in luck. Um, even today, we are doing uh, quite commonly uh, a procedure called valve-in-valve -valve TAVR, and that is patients who have old bioprosthetic valves, most commonly in the aortic position, but we're also doing them in the mitral position and the tricuspid position. And basically, you just put a valve inside that existing valve. Now, obviously, if it was a very small valve to begin with, you may not get the full benefit from the TAVR there. And there is some limit to how, how many times you can do this. It's a little bit like the Russian dolls that are nested inside each other. Eventually, uh, you're, you're putting a soda straw in there, and that wouldn't work too well. Uh, but I think in 15 years, we'll have some very good options for her uh, that uh, so she won't have to go through the... Uh, surgery again, and I think Dr. McCarthy has a comment on that. You know, Adam, the other thing I'd point out is just how quickly this is moving. 10 to 15 years ago, we weren't even thinking about this stuff. We weren't even talking about it. TAVR was just beginning, and it just happened to be last week that the FDA now has officially approved valve and valve for aortic valve. So everyone out there that has a tissue aortic valve, when it wears out, that might at least be a potential option for them going forward. And for instance, this week at Northwestern, we did three of those uh, for the valve and valve. So it's becoming um, every day that we do that. So that's actually very optimistic for you know how patients will be treated in 15 years. Wow, that's uh, that's amazing. Um, and so here, this is an interesting question from Valerie, and she's talking about pre-op preparations. She asks, how is a patient prepared for heart valve surgery and AFib surgery? Are there additional precautions or equipment used or taken? So I'm glad that we have Jane here for this because part of her job is to patient, uh, is patient preparation to explain to them about what to uh, expect. And she's also uh, an expert on the various types of equipment that we talk about. Hi, everybody. So in terms of the surgery itself and testing that you may have to go through before heart valve and AFib surgery, there's not a lot of difference in the pre-op testing. If we're not sure that you have an arrhythmia, we may want you to get a heart monitor before your surgery so that we can double check, especially if you're telling us that you're having symptoms of that percolating or fluttering feeling in your chest. We do have more information that we go over with patients who are going to have AFib surgery because we want to make sure that you are aware of how important the follow-up is after surgery. And we want to make sure that you're able to discuss that with the local doctors who are going to be taking care of you long-term after surgery. Our follow-up for AFib patients spans the six months to a year after surgery. In the first three months, medications that you may be on um, and continue will be stopped after we get some initial monitoring to make sure that the heart rhythm is um, converted back to normal rhythm and staying there. So it's a series of um, checking your rhythm at different time points with Holter monitors or event monitors or using the implanted pacemakers, if you happen to have that, to really check the rhythm well before we decide to stop antiarrhythmic medication, and then later um, possibly stopping Coumadin if that's a safe consideration for an individual patient. But there's a lot of um, communication that needs to happen with the doctors who are taking care of you. And actually, even after that, um, one-year period where you may be off medications, the recommendations are to still get monitoring every six months with a Holter monitor through the first two years after surgery. And we find that a lot of times patients are feeling great and they really don't feel the symptoms of the problems anymore with the valve repaired and the AFib surgery. So they tend to not get that monitoring 
um, we do want patients to know that if they ever feel some of those symptoms after they've had their procedure, they need to let people know because it's really important to check to see if there's any ASEB that's returned so that we can do something about that and keep that stroke, list, stroke risk very low. Great. Well, thank you, Jane, and thanks for all your incredible help with our patient community. We, we really appreciate it. Um, and let's see here. We have a question that came in from, uh, just so you know, we now have over 48 questions that have come in, so we're not going to be able to get to all of these today. we got time for maybe about one or two more. But this one comes in from Davian, Davian Kudelka. Hey, Damian, it's been a while since we talked. Hope you're doing good. Um, he asks, can the doctor speak a little bit about atrial flutter? Sure. Um, be happy to, to discuss that. Atrial flutter is a different type of irregular heart rhythm. Um, that is, uh, it has a, a sort of a different electrical genesis there, and um, um, it, in the, most patients who haven't had cardiac surgery, the hallmark of it is that it makes the atrium beat at about 300 beats per minute, so a very rapid uh, atrial contraction there, but it is pretty regular at 300. And then depending on how rapidly those uh, uh, beats get conducted to the ventricle, you may have heart rates at 150 or 100 or 75. It's some percentage of that. Now, the, the problem with that is um, that because the rhythm may feel regular, the patient and even the doctor, if they're listening to them, may detect nothing that says, uh, that there's an arrhythmia there. It may be a perfectly regular rhythm at 75, and yet if you do an electrocardiogram, you'll find that you're actually in atrial flutter there. Uh, so it is important uh, to never be completely reassured by a regular pulse. Uh, it could be atrial flutter there. Now, there are different approaches to treating it there. There are catheter approaches to it, and there are surgical approaches that are uh, just a different sort of uh, lesion set that the surgeon or the electrophysiologist would do to interrupt that. Pat, do you want to say anything uh, about a flutter ablation in your experience? Well, first of all, um, it's not as common as atrial fibrillation. We see it sometimes, but maybe it's about 5 to 10 percent of the rhythms that we treat, but they're closely related. When we actually do the procedure, I put those ablation lines in a little different spot, but a little too technical, I think, for uh, the audience at this point. Hey, Adam, can I mention something? You flipped up a question that was about the scar after surgery and can things be done. There are things sure. like silicone sure. gels that we put on the scar. You can actually pick them up at the pharmacy after surgery, and you should just avoid being in the uh, sun and things the first few months or a year even after surgery. Um, but one suggestion I'm going to make for your website is that a couple of times my patients have been posting their scar like, you know, three or four days after surgery. Show them again a year later because uh, a year later, most people, it's kind of a thin white line and it's really not that noticeable. And so my suggestion for your website and for your patients would be let's get the follow-up later because uh, about three days later it looks kind of, kind of ugly. But uh, after uh, all the healing is done, most people, you just hardly notice them. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. I'm now um, almost 10 years out from my surgery, and I um, cannot remember the last time that someone, when I'm out at the beach or at the pool, that anybody's even said, hey, what's that on your chest? It just becomes a very thin white line. So that's a really great point, Dr. McCarthy. And uh, with, with that response, I think we're going to go ahead and conclude uh, the webinar. Uh, but please, please, please don't ex exit um, just yet. On behalf of the entire community at heartvalvesurgery.com and all the patients with valve disease, I'd like to extend an extraordinary thank you to Dr. McCarthy, Dr. Thomas, uh, Jane, everybody at Northwestern for sharing your expertise with us today.
Um, as we end the web webinar, I'd also like to thank you, all the attendees who are on the call for your participation in this very special community event when we can all get together. And as we close, I'd like to ask you to complete a very quick survey that is about to appear on your screen. And as we always say here, uh, keep on ticking. Thank you, Dr. McCarthy. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Thomas, and thank you, Jane. Welcome. Thanks, Adam. Best to you and the family.